welcome to episode 22 of the Biohacking with Brittany podcast. Today we have on Sylvia Tabor. Her and I have been friends on Instagram for a while and she is actually somebody who practices the carnivore diet. And she's probably one of a handful of people I know who are eating this way currently. It's very new to mainstream, I would say. So it was really interesting having somebody come on and explain why she only eats meat and how to go about it if you were to decide to do that, how to start supplements, impacts, effects of it, everything. So we do a full run through of the carnivore diet and it's it's really interesting. So for everybody listening, part of my disclaimer would be just like any diet is that I'm not necessarily recommending the carnivore diet and I don't necessarily actually even recommend any sort of diet. I think it's different for everybody and different things work for different people at different times in their lives. So if you're listening to this, take it with a grain of salt and yeah, just be open to it. I would say, I think that if you're having such severe health problems where the only food you can digest is meat, I think it's time for you to see a holistic nutritionist or similar, like similar healthcare professional, because the carnivore diet is very strict and it's pretty hard for a lot of people. It's almost like keto. Keto is very restrictive as well, but obviously it's more trendy currently. But yeah, I would just be careful if you're going to experiment with the carnivore diet and do it with the assistance of a healthcare professional so that you know what you're doing and that you're doing it right. But yeah, enjoy this episode. It's really cool. I learned a lot. And yeah, it was awesome just to hear from somebody firsthand how it impacts her, impacts her hormones, especially from like a female perspective. So she and her business and all of her social media handles are linked in the show notes. And yeah, definitely take a look and reach out to her if you have any questions, because I'm sure she'd love to chat. So yeah, enjoy this episode. Thanks. Awesome. So Sylvia, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to have you here. We have been meaning to record this episode for quite a while now, especially just like with your current way of eating, which you identify as like carnivore, which is really, really interesting. So I would love for you to walk us through how you got to this point of eating meat only. I don't know many people who eat that way. And as someone who's like studying to be a nutritionist, I find it really interesting. So I would love for you to just like walk us through your journey and how you got to this point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's definitely been a long, long journey. And I never thought that I would end up eating just meat because carnivore is basically just eating meat and meat products or animal products like eggs, fish, you know, cheese and butter and animal fats and stuff like that. And the way I started, it probably goes way back to high school even when I moved to U.S. from Poland and I started having a lot of digestive issues, low energy, mood swings. And granted, I was just a teenager too, but In Poland, I never remember going through like all these different health issues that I was dealing with once I arrived in in the U.S. So from there, I started like digging into, you know, nutrition and, and just exercise and just see what would work. Like growing up in Poland, we never were (laughs) pill-based to say in a way because we never treated anything with with pills in Poland unless it was just like very severe case but it was mostly just about food you know my great-grandmother would always find some sort of potion that she would make out of a wild plant that she would gather and that was our medicine back in Poland so here in the U.S. I never really looked into supplements. For me, it was just, oh, it has to be food, you know? And then I started noticing, you know, like, oh, yeah, sugar is kind of making me feel horrible, you know? And then certain carbs would make me feel bad. And when I was growing up in Poland, like bread, we made our own bread, you know, sourdough bread and whatnot. And we did eat other grains and I was always fine. And then In the U.S., that wasn't the case, especially with bread. Now we know, we find out that the grains that we have today, especially in the U.S., are so genetically modified 
that it's not really the grain that our ancestors used to have. So there was a lot of issues with that for me, and I eliminated very early dairy and grains. And from then on, my health did improve a little bit. But then I went to college and I started exploring the vegan realm of things. And I've watched a few documentaries about vegan and, you know, why it's the way to go. And, you know, if you need animals, you know, the earth is just going to perish sooner than later, you know. And me thinking that, you know, vegan diet was going to save the planet and make everybody happy and my body healthy and strong, I went into veganism and then I transitioned to raw vegan and then fruitarian diet. And then towards the end of the raw vegan, I started having a lot of digestive issues, even more than when I first came to U.S. And I started having a lot of skin rashes, a lot of bloating, and a lot of indigestion. And even with a vegan diet, I always, always researched everything very well before I would dive into it. And I was very familiar that I needed to supplement with certain things because not all the nutrients are available in the vegan diet. And you kind of have to make sure you design it in a way that works well for your body. I did that and I was supplementing with a lot of things and still, you know, coming with a lot of indigestion and and stuff like that. So then eventually I decided to go fruitarian, which is basically just eating fruits because of my indigestion and just not being able to digest anything. Everything that would go in would come out pretty much looking the same way. So I figured, okay, this is not right. So then I went fruitarian for about a year. And I started having very, very severe depression, anxiety, and I just started putting on a lot of weight as well. And I was never satisfied eating that way. I would eat so much fruit and I would just be more hungry. And it turned into almost binge eating. Not almost, it was binge eating. And it it felt like I was very out of control. And it almost was like, somebody or something would take over my body and it was just like do whatever and just eat, eat. It was almost like I turned into this animal that just wanted to eat all the time, but yet I wasn't feeling satisfied. My stomach would look like I was pregnant, nine months pregnant from eating all that food, but my brain was constantly just hungry, hungry for more. So from that, I got really, really depressed to a point when I just wanted to take my life. And I figured this is not worth it. This is not working. I have to look the other way. And after a while, I got to a point where I just wasn't able to eat anything but animal foods. So I went keto and between carnivore and then fruitarian diet. And, you know, of course, I did experiments just eating balanced diet and tracking macros and eating the rice and the vegetables and, you know, a little bit of protein and this and that and including healthy fats. I did try all of that. But after a while, I was still reacting to simple things like broccoli or cauliflower, you know, things that I always thought that, you know, there should be healing for my body. And I was just so confused because I also studied nutrition and, you know, like I was in the program to be a dietitian. And everything you learn in that program is definitely the opposite of carnivore. You know, you need your grains, you need your fiber, you need your fruits and vegetables, you know, and that just confused me so much. But I was at a point where I had to look the other way. And, you know, I went from keto, which was largely still plant-based. I would include a little bit of eggs, but at the beginning I was, reacting to those. I did eat sardines. I included sardines, but I was getting very inflamed from sardines from a can and I couldn't figure out what was going on with that. And then I finally decided to just go for beef. And beef at that point for me was just a scary thought. Like it was a no no at my house because oh it's a fatty you know, it's a fatty piece of me, then it's going to clog your arteries and your cholesterol is going to go up and you're going to die of a heart attack. So 
that was sort of the mentality at my house. And I was also afraid of it just from like having the still a little bit of the vegan mentality. But I decided to try it anyway. And it was the only thing that really made me feel very strong, very strong and just energized. And it's probably the iron and the meat as well. And I've been always anemic. So I started at that point, including more and more beef and eliminating more and more vegetables. And when I was keto, I didn't really eat much fruit. Sometimes I would have aronia berries or some other wild berries like huckleberries or sea blackthorn, which are very pretty sour and <laughs> hard to eat too. But I figured, oh, I had a lot of vitamin C. And from then on, I cut down to just eating a wide variety of different vegetable, not vegetables, but meats. I did include pork later on. I did include chicken. And eventually I was able to add in eggs because my gut started healing a little bit more. So eggs were a go for me later on. And then I kind of like cleaned it up a little bit more in terms of carnivore diet. And I just started adding in organ meats and then pretty much was eating or am eating just ruminants, which is goat, lamb meat, and beef. And sometimes I do include seafood occasionally. And if I do go out and my friends offer like chicken or something like that, I, or duck, you know, I won't discriminate. But majority of the time, I would say 95% of the time, it's, it's beef for me, organ meat, and water or drinks. I've eliminated coffee few months back and I've also noticed huge huge benefit even in terms of my period I would always have severe cramps and just that time of the month was just deliberating for me I would curl up in my bed and the cramps were just horrible headache but after eliminating coffee and just being purely a mainly carnivore has helped with that tremendously as well so now it's been almost two years and I'm feeling great. I don't know if in the future that's going to change. I feel like our bodies do change. But so far, this has been the easiest decision for me to just keep going because I honestly just feel amazing. Wow. That's like such a interesting and long journey that you've been on with like your <laughs> diet and your food. So as we were talking about your, your health journey going through all of these different diets, figuring out what works for you. It's just so surprising because like, obviously, you know, since you've studied nutrition, that most of the time when people react to certain foods, it's the proteins in those foods that they are reacting to in their gut. So things like different nuts or proteins in dairy and same with meat, that that is like what causes inflammation and a lot of symptoms. So to switch to a carnivore diet that is obviously protein heavy is really against, I guess, like what you learn in school and like what people advocate online and like general knowledge. But it sounds like like this really works for you and has totally really helped with your symptoms. Right. And that's what you learn in school about the proteins. That's what they say that the body react to but there's many anti-nutrients in all of the plants you know mm -hmm. plants created their defense mechanism through creating these anti-nutrients that essentially protect them and especially seeds and nuts and grains they have this outer layer that is basically all anti-nutrients and sometimes we can process these foods in a certain way like we can soak and sprout nuts to eliminate a lot of oxalates and phytates and other stuff but it doesn't always remove most of it but you know a lot of nuts do have a lot of oxalates and then especially almonds and people who struggle with joint pain and other inflammatory issues for me <laughs> it was funny because every time i would eat almonds i would have this rash going along my long intestine like you could see the track on my stomach like this red rash and that's what i thought too you know it's only proteins but later on i'd done a lot of research into plants and it turns out they're not as magical as we think they are 
And there's a lot of nutrients in them that actually don't get absorbed by our bodies because our bodies can't process it. And most of those nutrients get trapped in the fiber. And, you know, everybody glorifies fiber. There's a great book called Fiber Manus, and it talks about how it is actually not a good thing. And a lot of those nutrients get uh, trapped in the fibers and we don't absorb them. You know, if we absorb 20 to 30 percent from the nutrients that a lot of labels claim that uh, vegetables and fruits have in them, that's it, you know. And then there are the anti-nutrients that our bodies react to. And I thought to myself, maybe it's just not worth it. And animal foods, they're loaded with nutrients that our body are actually able to absorb fully. And then there's many studies showing that if you combine animal foods with fiber, let's say the zinc in oysters, if you just eat oysters on its own, your body will absorb about 70 plus percent of that zinc. If you combine it with, I think the study combined it with corn tortillas or something like that. And I don't know who would want to eat oysters with corn tortillas, but that's what they did. (laughs) And they were only able to absorb, I think, like 10% of the zinc. And they were combining it with different foods as well. And the more fiber there was, the less absorption it resulted in. So that's another thing, you know. We think that we get all these amazing nutrients from plants, fruits, vegetables, and uh, all the super powders and potions. But that might not be the case necessarily. Yeah, So for those people who don't know, can you explain what an anti-nutrient is? Because I feel like this is a very new term and a lot of people who actually like haven't studied nutrition probably like can assume what that means, but don't actually know. And then like the common examples as well, like what, like where are they found and in like what foods? All right. Well, anti-nutrients are essentially chemicals that react. Sometimes they even pull out the good stuff out of our bodies. And it can be things like lectins, oxalates, phytates. Those are the three that I can think of right now. But they're like oxalates, for example, are found in spinach and kale and nuts. Those are probably like the top the things that the oxalates are abundant in. And oxalates can cause a lot of issues. If people Google just oxalate toxicity, they can find that kidney disease or kidney stones are actually caused by oxalates. And just simple things like joint pains. A lot of people even experience eczema and a lot of gut issues as well, hormonal uh, disturbances. And then we have lectins, and lectins are found with a lot of vegetables as well. And stuff like, I believe, winter squashes. Gosh, I can think of other things. I know they're in, like, again, like if people Google it, they can find a whole list of vegetables and fruits that lectins are in. And then we have phytates, which are usually in grains. And they're in the outer layer. And then there are also things, you know, like in brown rice, there's things uh, like arsenic, you know, like they say, uh, what I've learned is that, you know, like kids should not be eating anything with brown rice because brown rice is loaded with arsenic. Actually, white rice is much better because the outer layer is removed, the anti nutrients are removed, it's easier on digestion and it still has small levels of arsenic but it's much much more healthier than brown rice and you know for many years we were led to believe that oh you know brown rice is so much better because it's the whole grain and it's more fiber and this and that and it's not the case and there are proper ways to prepare certain foods to remove the anti-nutrients you know, like, for example, I, I think that most of the lectins you can remove just by pressure cooking vegetables. But you also, you know, discarding a lot of the good vitamins, you know, that are usually destroyed with high heat. And then with oxalates, oxalates are a little bit more tricky because you can't really destroy them. You can remove them and 
you know, you can boil potatoes and then you discard that water and you eliminating a little bit of those oxalates, but you can't really destroy them. You can eliminate a little bit of them. And same thing with grains, you can soak them, you can sprout them and just, you know, discard the water. So there are ways to eliminate those things. For me, even doing that, you know, going through the whole process of soaking, sprouting, boiling, you know, it still didn't work for me. My gut was way, way too sensitive for all of that. Yeah, I think the first time I heard about lectins was from Dr. Stephen Gundry, and he wrote the book, The Plant Paradox. I don't know if you've read that. I'm sure you have. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And then I actually also learned about lectins in school and mainly exactly what you're saying about how nightshade vegetables tend to cause inflammation in joints for a lot of people. So yeah, for people listening, nightshade vegetables include peppers, potatoes, eggplants, and tomatoes. And then other foods that have lectins in them aside from that is like legumes, which is like beans, peas, lentils, peanuts, squash, some fruit and grains. I'm just reading off a list here. And so like, if you do have joint pain, trying to go on a lectin-free diet, I guess, quote unquote diet, can definitely help. And like, it is been proven in a lot of research to this point, especially like with the nightshade vegetables, like I said. So I totally get what you're saying about like avoiding these certain things to help you feel better. It's just so interesting that like you're at a point where the only thing that you actually feel good on is meat. And I'm assuming like you're eating like high quality organic grass fed type of thing. Yes, correct. That's one thing that's very important to me. And it always has been, you know, even as a vegan, I never really ate any of the vegan junk foods that they had just because it had a label saying Mm -hmm. that said vegan, I would never eat that stuff. You know, for me, it was always just whole foods, you know, that I would prepare myself and it was mostly fruits, vegetables, I would eat some fermented soy. But then I also eliminated later on soy because it didn't, again, it caused a lot of digestive issues. But quality always mattered to me. So now I'm just still sticking to that, you know, eating meat and grass-fed, grass-finished, you know, local is important to me. I do want to support the local farmers as much as I can. And, you know, things like that, just making sure that the source of my fuel comes from happy animals, you know. Yeah. Where are you currently located? Currently, I just moved this year from California to Arizona. So I'm in Phoenix right now. Okay. And how do you find the accessibility to high quality meats like where you are right now? It was definitely much easier in California. Right now, it's not hard. It's not hard at all because you can go to farmer's markets and they're here pretty much the whole year because there's no winter here pretty much. So Wednesdays, Saturdays, weekends, you know, I go to farmer's markets and find local farmers. And then one local farmer that I found, they actually do sell at a grocery chain. So if I run out and I can't wait to, you know, for another farmer's market, I can just go to a store and just buy their meat there. But it's very accessible. Yeah. Oh, definitely. That's really good. And and I can imagine just in California, how easy it would have been for you. Um, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm in Vancouver and it's pretty similar vibes of like wellness and very healthy and holistic views of life. So I would love for you to kind of walk us through a day of eating for you. So like, what does breakfast look like? Your snacks, lunch, dinner. So like we can fully get an idea of like, just like what it looks like. Well, for me, I do eat breakfast. I know a lot of people in the carnivore or keto community skip breakfast. They do intermittent fasting till noon and then they eat dinner. For me, it is breakfast. I do have a smaller breakfast and it's usually probably like maybe eight ounce steak, a little bit of liver and egg yolk. The reason why I do have breakfast is because I have noticed that if I don't, my hormones kind of go crazy and then I end up overeating later in a day. So for me, just to keep everything balanced, breakfast is important. And again, it's not a big breakfast. And then I do have second meal and it's usually before 3 p.m. And most of the time it's 
at 1 p.m. And then my second meal is usually much bigger. When I have a pound of some sort of steak, I might again have a little bit of liver. And that's it. Sometimes instead of liver, I have mussels or oysters or maybe tiny fish like smelts and that's all and that's the second meal for me and the reason why I make my second meal bigger is because I do believe that as human beings we are kind of linked into like the ancestral um still linked into to the ancestral people that we come from and when you look into Ayurveda they're a huge believer that you know in the morning, your digestion is not as optimal as it is at noon. And that's kind of linked to sun as well. So in the morning when you wake up, although you do build up a lot of hydrochloric acid, it's still not as, power, not as powerful as it is at noon. And they do believe that it is because of the sun. So I kind of try to follow the circadian rhythm when it comes to eating. And for me, that's the last meal. Because then I just want to, at night, I want to make sure that my digestion is not ramping up because of a big meal. So my body is kind of relaxed and just focus on healing during sleep and rest. So that's my reason to be uh, for that. And that's what has worked for me the best. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's eating in a rhythmic fashion or with your circadian rhythm is, is definitely beneficial to a lot of people. I even noticed that myself, like if I eat late at night before sleep, like I can see it on my aura ring score and just like how, how rested I feel the next day is like not as optimal as I would like. If I stop eating around like 7 PM or whenever the sun may go down and go to sleep around 10, I definitely have a better night's sleep. So in terms of like your supplements that you are taking like i'm assuming you are taking supplements here what are you taking and what do you think is necessary if you were to try the carnivore diet in order to supplement your diet like like what do you think that you need that you might not be getting from only animal sources i personally do believe that you can get everything through carnivore diet there's carnivore diet is so nutrient dense but people have to make sure that they do eat you know organ meats and things like liver, things like kidneys, those are so nutrient dense and you can get the vitamin C from that. You can get the folate from egg yolks, but obviously, you know, not everybody likes eating organ meats. They're not the most, you know, <laughs> pleasant yeah. thing to eat, yeah. you know. So for women especially, I think folate is very important. And then I do see some of my clients that I'm coaching that do decide to do carnivore diet they are low on certain B vitamins. So for women, especially, folate is very important. So I think that that's something that they might want to supplement. And other stuff, if someone is a high-performing athlete, electrolytes are really crucial and important. Like for me, I'm not exactly exercising right now because of my knee injury but I do a lot of infrared saunas and I do sweat a lot in that I do saunas twice a day sometimes I do notice when I'm dehydrated and I do supplement myself with electrolytes and I do believe that other people who do exercise a lot and do saunas they do need it you know and if you're kind of in tune with your body you know when you need that stuff I don't necessarily do it every single day. I think the point of supplements is you supplement it when you need it. If you make it everyday type thing, then it's not really a supplement. It's almost like your food, you know? But again, like you kind of have to be in tune with your body. And that's what also carnivore helped me with kind of figure out what I need, you know, versus like before I would just take a lot of pills on daily basis because you know somebody told me or I read somewhere you need this every single day and I'm a huge believer in testing as well because most of the time I feel amazing but there are certain deficiencies like vitamin C deficiency you can be deficient for two years and then all of a sudden it comes up as a major disease you know and might you might not even notice it you know through the through those first two years, but then later it just comes down to something that you could have prevented just by taking a vitamin C supplement. So personally, 
I do supplement with just electrolytes right now. Sometimes I actually do take amino acids because I do eat a lot of meat. That's true. But again, not all of it gets absorbed. And then to heal my gut, I needed something that's very quickly absorbable. And then I did do tests and I found out that in spite of eating all that animal protein, I was still deficient in certain amino acids. So I started supplementing with essential amino acids just, you know, for gut health and making sure that everything is balanced. Yeah. I think there's definitely something to be said about intuitive eating and being aware of what you are craving or what you need in that moment and then supplementing appropriately. I think there's a lot to say about that. And I think that has a lot of validity. And then also with testing, like testing is huge, whether you're testing your gut, your hormones, or I do like food sensitivity tests. I try to do it like once a year, maybe once every two years now where you go into a clinic and they test you for the most common sensitivities and it's like 90 different things. And a lot of it does look at different nuts and grains and meat sources. And so you're kind of just getting this idea of what works with your body and what doesn't work. And then there's just, there's like a whole bunch of other tests you can do as well. Like there's the Dutch hormone test, which a lot of people love, um, especially in the biohacking world. And then Viome, I don't know, have you ever done the, the Viome testing? Yes, I have done Viome. I have done Cyrex for food intolerances, which I believe is like the gold standard to test mm-hmm. for food intolerances. And they test so many things and they test for cooked and raw, which I do like when that they do that. And I've also done Viome. But what was interesting to me, I did Viome when they first like came out with it. And I had other friends and people I knew who also have done it. And a lot of the recommendations they gave me was things that I was intolerant to. And I thought, oh, well, maybe something changed. So I would, like, for instance, I'm intolerant to salmon. And every time I eat it, I do get skin rash. And then my heart rate goes up like very rapidly and I get a nosebleed. So then I thought, oh, maybe something has changed. Maybe now my gut, you know, fixed and I can eat that uh, now. So I tried it and (laughs) I did came up with the same reaction to it. So I don't necessarily believe that the maybe combination of food intolerance with a biome and kind of eliminating the foods that you're intolerant to and following biome could be helpful. But at the same time, there were just... Other things that made me wonder, because a lot of my friends uh, and people I know who tested with it, they kind of got the same recommendations in terms of food. And some had maybe a little bit more carbs, other were a little bit more on carbs. But in terms of everything else, the suggestions were the same. So at first, I tried following what the app was telling me, but it didn't last long. It lasted maybe a week because I just wasn't feeling good. Hmm, that's so interesting. Yeah, I haven't done the biome testing yet. For those people who don't know, it's basically they test the different bacteria in your gut and give you diet recommendations on your gut microbiome, basically. Um, right. So yeah, like if you have high levels of one type of strain and low levels of another, and they just kind of look at the big picture. And I think it is amazing that we're getting to a point where we can test that at such a micro level of our health and like see how we're doing. But at the same time, like you said, they can suggest salmon, but if you get a nosebleed from salmon, you're not going to be eating (laughs) salmon, even though your gut bacteria might benefit from it. Right. So yeah, taking it all with a grain of salt. So I know that you coach clients through this type of work. Do you recommend the carnivore diet to them or is it kind of like, what works best for the individual? It's what works best for the individual. Like, I don't believe that everybody should go carnivore. You know, this is what works for me. And Mm -hmm. sometimes I actually talk people out of going carnivore because I, from the conversation that I have with my clients, I know it's not for them. You know, I, I just know it's not for them. And like I said, it's not for everybody. It might be a great thing to do for a month to just see, you know, I'm going to eliminate all the plants 
and then I'm going to start adding in to see if I'm reacting to it. So it's sort of like cleaning your slate. Like, okay, for a month, I'm just going to do meats and then whatever the favorite food might be, I'll add it after a month and see if I react to it and how it's making me feel. So I think that could be a great tool to use, but to go as far as recommending it for everyone, no, I, I really like to work with my clients, listen to what they need and go from there and definitely not pushing carnivore on them. If it's something that they really, really want to try and they feel like they're going to do amazing on it, I coach them through that, you know, how to start and how to go through the whole process. Otherwise, no, I, I definitely don't push it on people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And I totally respect that because there are some people online who really just promote like one type of way of eating, right? Whether it's keto, carnivore, whatever it is, but it doesn't work for everybody. And one diet, one size doesn't fit all. It's like, it's totally true. So it's basically about experimenting what works for you now. And because over time, you as well, like you said, right? You've been carnivore for two years, but maybe in another two years, it's no longer going to work for you because your body changes. And it's kind of having this idea of like being flexible with the way you eat is kind of my approach to things. It's just more sustainable for the long term as well. It's like eating healthy in general rather than like the strict diet that I'm going to be on for the rest of my life. <laughs> like exactly. Yeah. I don't even I don't like identifying myself with the diet, you know. If I go out if there, there's something like oh my God, you know, I never had this before. If I traveled to some like exotic place and there was a fruit that I always wanted to try and I would try it, you know, it's not, oh, I'm a carnivore. I can't eat that. You know, I I don't like that type of mentality. If it's something I want to try, if things change, I'll change that. I don't want to be in a place where I was as a vegan when it was almost like a religion that, oh no, like this is evil. This is absolutely no, no. And I'm going to be this way forever. Like I don't want to get to that place. So I'm definitely open to changes. And I feel like my gut has healed so much since, and I could probably eat, you know, things that I couldn't before and be fine with it now. But at this point, and my thinking is like, it's not really benefiting me in any way. And I don't really have cravings for anything either. So we'll see. <laughs> Time will tell if things change. I mean, I'll be definitely open about it. And and I always talk about my journey on Instagram. So people definitely will, <laughs> will find out if, I, <laughs> if I'm no longer carnivore. Yeah. Oh, for <laughs> sure. So if I was to try being carnivore for a month or somebody else would, or just wants to experiment with it, maybe for no specific time frame. How would you start? How would I start? Where do I go? Do I just like eliminate all plants right at once? Or like, what do you recommend? I think the easiest way is to start slow. I mean, there are some people who can go like right to it. They're, you know, committed and decide that day, okay, I'm just going to eat meat from now on. So there are people who can do that. Other people might need a little bit of like, you know, elimination time when they just lower their intake of vegetables or fruits and just make meat the main portion of their meal. And then slowly they start eliminating more and more and eventually it just comes down to meat. Mm -hmm. And like I said, other people can just go straight for it. When I first was transitioning, I kind of gave myself two weeks to transition. (laughs) And I loved aronia berries. And they're kind of like blueberries, but they're much more tart. They're not Mm. sweet. And they're much darker. They're almost black. And I had like probably 12 pounds of them in my freezer because I would order online from Canada, actually. So I had that and like I would do fine throughout the whole day, but then I knew they were in my freezer and they were just like on the back of my mind. I'm like, oh my God, I just want some berries right now. So throughout the first two weeks, I kind of like at night, I would still eat a little bit of the berries. But then once they were gone, like it was out of my house, I was fine. Like I had no problems just going straight for me. But that was, you know, that was my case. And sometimes that might be too for other people, you know, when they live by myself. So that was definitely much easier for me. 
when you're surrounded by other tempting foods, especially people who do have kids and moms who have to prepare lunches for kids or make other meals for kids and for the family, that can be hard, you know? So it's really depending on a situation on the individual. Yeah. There's not really like a one template that I could mm-hmm. give, you know, oh, this is what works for everyone. Yeah, I find right now I'm pretty good with eliminating certain things. So certain times of the year, I've started eliminating alcohol. So there's certain months where I'll go alcohol free. Um, not that I ever really drink that much throughout the year anyway, but like just zero percent. And I'm very like black and white like that. Like I'll just stop doing something and I'll be fine. But I think with the carnivore diet, if I were to try it and I totally would be open to trying it because I think that, you know, as a nutritionist, it's good to just explore different things. I think I would struggle actually going like straight into meat only and animal protein only, not really from the habit side of things, but more from the side of things like I don't really crave animal protein ever. Like sometimes I will, I think, especially around like menstruation, you end up like craving iron a bit. So like I crave a burger or that type of thing. But throughout the day, like I don't really gravitate towards it. And I actually find with my partner, when he's away for work or family or whatever, I actually will eat less meat when he's not with me for a week. And when I grocery shop, I'll end up having days where I'm vegan, vegetarian, and not even crave it or want it. So I think I would struggle with that. But I don't know if you have any tips around that. But I guess it just takes time to adjust, maybe. I mean, I feel like a lot of people who do turn into carnivore are people who struggle a lot with their health. And I'm assuming Mm -hmm. you're probably very healthy. So you're Mm -hmm. not, you know, I was at a point where I I had no options. Like this was it or nothing else will work. So I feel like a lot of people come to this diet because of that. You know, people who are healthy and eating uh, plants and fruits and works for them, they don't struggle with weight, they don't struggle with mental health, then they don't really have that drive, you know, Mm, to go and push for it, you know. So it's like you can always fast for three days and then afterwards you're probably going to be able to eat anything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I feel like carnivore is probably much easier to do for... People are more motivated to do it when they struggle with something, to be honest, with some health issue. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're generally healthy, eating the way you're eating, why force it? It's also mental too, you know? If you're going to suffer mentally because you want to be carnivore for a month don't do it I mean at the end of it you're just gonna end up binge eating everything that you Mm -hmm. restricted yourself from you know and that can turn into mental disease so I would say you know if you're feeling pretty balanced right now just stick to what you're doing right now and what's working for you right now yeah I currently eliminate all grains, dairy, and sugar, and basically paleo some days I am vegetarian though I mean don't eat anything from animals, and I also don't eat soy, so that's kind of like my pillars and and it's been like that for quite a long time, and that works for me, but yeah, I definitely agree with that. I just think it's more about your relationship with your food, maybe more than the actual food itself so you know, if you're restrictive and you have a terrible relationship with food and you're restricting and then you're binging. And then like you said, like there's really mental illness and emotional eating and just issues, disorders that can come from that type of thinking and that I've seen in a lot of people. So you really have to be careful, I think, with like trying new things. And even with fasting, I mean, I see so many people fast Mm -hmm. for so many days and then when you see them eat again, it's crazy. It's like it's they're not themselves, you know, and that's another way that you can turn something that once was healthy, you know, fasting to something that's like almost like a punishment. And now I'm going to fast for three days because I ate so much, you know. And that's another thing that I see a lot of people do, you know, with now fasting yeah. being so popular. Yeah, and the same with like, oh, I had dessert. So tomorrow I'll work extra hard at the gym. Like it's the exactly. same thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, like, yeah. It's, it's a form of punishment. Like people yeah. don't exercise. Well, I shouldn't say all people, you know, but many people go to the gym to 
and they look so miserable and it's a form of punishment and like don't do that like go outside and walk and hike and enjoy the nature and just move because you enjoy it not because you want to punish yourself because you had one extra cookie yesterday so Mm -hmm. It has to be balanced. Yeah, it has to be balanced and it has to be about the relationship to your body and your food and your exercise routine rather than the actual thing itself. And I, I think it's hard though. I think like a lot of social media and just the world doesn't really talk about that. It's all about being super fit and going to the gym five times a week and eating this certain way and the newest diet and just like this aggressive way really about it for females and males really. So I think it's great that you are educating people on a different way and just really encouraging people at the root of what you do. And I think that's just amazing. Yeah, thank you. And at the same time, you know, I feel like a lot of women, even with the keto being so popular now, a lot of women think that they can do everything that men can do, you know, even from hormonal standpoint, fasting till noon or fasting for so long that can mess up your cycle pretty badly you know i have clients who lose their cycle because they fast too much so what men can do women shouldn't necessarily do that you know like men are totally different animal than women are we're supposed to keep our body healthy and balanced and Mm -hmm. we're supposed to bring babies to this world not to say that you know oh don't exercise don't do this don't do that you know don't do everything that men do but at the same time just like don't try to follow some guy who's you know fasting for five days and going lifting and crossfit every single day because that's that's not the way to do it either yeah i agree with you women actually need fat on their bodies And you can see that, right? Like if you've ever looked at like body fat percentages compared to males compared to females, females is always higher. And there's a reason for that. And it's because we're supposed to carry babies and have that padding, quote unquote padding around your body to protect yourself. And also, yeah, you need a healthy amount of fat on your body for healthy hormone production and regulation. So I definitely agree with you. Females are so different from males biologically and in in any way really, but biologically at a cellular level, we are very, very different. And so we can't take the same advice that males use and think we're going to get the same results and it not have any side effects. Like it just doesn't work like that. Exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was awesome. I learned so much from you. I am like super interested in the carnivore diet. Now I'm going to go do some research and see maybe how I feel about it. Maybe I'll try it out. So I would definitely recommend checking out Dr. Paul Saladino. He has so much information. His podcast is amazing. He's probably the one carnivore that has more balanced approach to carnivore versus like, no, just stick and solve. So I definitely (laughs) recommend Dr. Paul Saladino. He's he's an amazing guy. Awesome. Yeah, I will link him in the show notes and take a look and listen to his podcast because I definitely would like to learn more. So where can people find you? How can they connect with you online, social media? I'm only on Instagram, basically, at biohacking.chick. Other than that, my website, biohackingchick.com, if people want to do some coaching, not just carnivore coaching, <laughs> um, but coaching for anything pretty much. Awesome. Okay. I will put those links in the show notes. Yeah. And thanks again for coming on. It was, it was really great chatting. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Shoot me a message if you want to chat about it, about your thoughts on the carnivore diet. If you want to try it, if you have any misunderstandings or yeah, just like basically what you think. I'd love to chat about it. It's definitely something that's new and upcoming and it's gaining more and more popularity. I think as time goes by, I don't think it's mainstream yet, but it probably will be as all these health fads and diets are probably will be within maybe a year or so. So I guess we'll see how that goes, but yeah, thanks for listening and tune in for another episode in a couple weeks. Thanks.